Hello everybody out there, how you doing? Today we are going to be revisiting the affidavit from Zellner's expert on prosecutorial misconduct. So this is interesting, obviously you know who it's going to be about. It's going to be about Kratz, press conference, uh, you know, all that stuff. So, and, and you're going to see this guy's credentials, they're through the roof. Uh, this guy made, you know, a career out of chasing down dirty politicians and DA um, you know, district attorneys and other political officials in the state of um, New York. So uh, this guy, this guy has a lot of experience in pr prosecutorial misconduct, what it looks like, um, and all that various things. In fact, he gets approached quite often to to for his expertise in pr prosecutorial misconduct. So anyway, we'll go ahead and move into it here and you'll see that uh the, you know he, he just points out a lot of the a lot of things that he feels kratz went wrong with uh he points out he feels that kratz kind of knowingly did it um you know which is kind of a big step usually um people usually don't like to get too accusatory but with you know in this case the guy did he he actually says it uh, you know basically in plain plain english that he believes that ken kratz was purposely holding the um, press conference because he wanted to get that in he wanted that he wanted the potential jury pool to be informed about those things because he knew he wouldn't be able to bring it in in court so uh, because he knew he pretty much knew he would not be calling Brendan because Brendan was already recanting his confession and, and all those things um, so we know that he already pretty much knew he wasn't going to be able to use the confession at Stephen's trial. And if he did, then Dean and Jerry would just pick Brendan apart. I mean, literally, they would just pick him apart. And I mean, I don't mean that in a bad way. I actually mean that in a good way. Kratz didn't want this to happen with Brendan on the stand for a very particular reason. Because he knew Dean and Jerry would 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 ask the questions and expose, um, you know, the missteps. And so certainly Kratz didn't want to give Dean and Jerry a pop at that. So it was he, he makes the assertion that basically Kratz knew he wouldn't be using this at trial, but he wanted the public to be informed about it. So this is interesting stuff. Uh, this is part one of two. Uh, obviously, you're watching part one right now, and part two will be tomorrow um, about, well, about six or seven o'clock tomorrow, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, anyways, so let's move into it, and uh, and we'll see what you think. So we're gonna move into what we're doing here. So the first part we're gonna, first thing we're gonna, you know, go into here is why are we listening to this Bennett Gershman? Who is this Bennett Gershman? Why should we, why should we be listening to anything that this person has to say? What makes them so special, right? Okay. First thing we're gonna look at here is basically gonna tell you, Mister, uh, Mister Gershman's history. And, and, and all of the, you know, basically all the jobs that Mr. Gershman has held and w how those things kind of uniquely qualify him for this exact type of situation. So we'll move into that document right now. We'll see you in a few. This is where Mr. Uh, Gershman is talking about his background and experience. I have had considerable experience as a prosecutor, defense attorney, and academic. I served as an assistant district attorney in the office of the New York County District Attorney from 1966 to 1972, where I was assigned to the homicide rackets, appeals, and major felony bureaus. I, present, I presented hundreds of cases to grand juries and tried numerous felony cases to verdict. I served also as an assistant attorney general in the office of the New York State Prose Special Prosecutor's Office from 1972 to 1976, which was established to investigate and prosecute official and political corruption in New York City's criminal justice system. I was chief of the Appeals Bureau and of the Bronx Anti-Corruption Bureau, where I investigated cases, presented cases to special grand juries, and prosecuted many public officials, including judges, prosecutors, attorneys, police officers, and other public officials that, that were corrupt or fraudulent. I am currently a tenured professor at the of law at the Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace. 
University, where I have taught since 1976. I teach courses in criminal law, criminal procedure, and constitutional law, evidence, trial practice, and professional ethics. During my academic career, I have served as a defense attorney, representing many persons charged with serious felonies, including murder, rape, organized crime, and drug cases. I have represented clients before federal and state grand juries. I am frequently consulted as an expert on criminal procedure, prosecutorial misconduct, and professional ethics. I have had I have, have testified as an expert witness in judicial proceedings and before the United States Congress, the New York State Legislator, and various professional and fact-finding commissions. Okay, so we're all on board with now why we we are listening to this guy and why what he has to say may actually be of worth, right? Because, well, this is what he did. This is how he practiced as an attorney was by chasing down corrupt political f officials and uh, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, anybody, you know, other uh, elected, you know, offices or, or public offices, publicly held offices and things like that. That was what he did. It's what he specialized in. And he is, as he said, often sought out for his expertise in prosecutorial misconduct cases. So that's why what this man has to say is important. And so now we're going to move into where he now begins to talk about. Obviously, I'm not going to go through everything he says, but I'm going to hit the high points here. We're going to move right to where he talks about uh, March 1st and March 2nd when King Kratz did the press conference. So we're going to see what this gentleman has to say about King Kratz's little press conference and, and theatrics there. So here we go. Kratz held several press conferences in connection with the Avery case, but two are notable on March 1st, 2006 and March 2nd, 2006. Given the sensational nature of the case, which Kratz called the largest criminal investigation that anybody, that anybody has ever talked about, Kratz was obviously aware that anything he said would have had powerful impact on public opinion about the case. Thus, on March 1st, Several months after Avery had originally been charged with the Halbach murder, Kratz announced significant developments in the case. He told the large throng of media attendees that law enforcement now has a definitive set of answers as to what happened to Teresa Halbach. <clears throat> he asserted that as he was speaking, a, a search warrant was simultaneously being executed on the Avery premises and that we know exactly what to look for and where to look for it. Kratz ended the press conference by inviting the media to a second press conference the following day in which he intim intimated there would be a stunning announcement. Well, let's see what Robert Milan thinks about this situation. I looked at this, I, like the dean, I did a crash course on making a murder this week. I watched all 10 episodes in three separate days and I found myself screaming at the television and, and, and screaming at, mis at Mr. Kratz like the rest of you. And, and as I broke this thing down, this is how I looked at it. It's, uh, it started out with the conflict of interest. I mean, how did this whole thing start going south? That they were wise enough to call in a special prosecutor, a moronic special prosecutor, but they, <laughs> they, they brought in a special prosecutor, but they weren't wise enough to keep the original cops out of this. Um, and that's shocking. So that's how this whole thing starts going sideways. Followed by Kratz's press conference, regarding Mr. Dassey's confession, which was outrageous, followed by the fact that Kratz commits a huge discovery violation by questioning Bobby Dassey during the trial about a, a statement that the defense attorneys never heard about before, um, followed by the defense attorney for Brendan Kaczynski absolutely selling him out with the investigator, following, followed by a series of rulings by the judge that were outrageous. One, no gag order. I mean, why prosecutors and defense attorneys are stepping up to cameras after every day of trial is beyond me. Um, and then followed by what I already mentioned, which was zero corroboration to substantiate the confession. Yeah, you gotta love that guy, Robert Milan, man. He's freaking aces. He's, he is absolutely stellar. So here we go. The next day, March 2nd, Kratz held the press conference after warning children not to watch. 
Kratz related to a huge assembled media and a live television audience the, the horrific details in Brendan Dassey's confession and how he was invited into Avery's trailer, saw Teresa Halbach naked, and shackled to Avery's bed, and how he and Avery repeatedly raped, tortured, and gruesomely butchered her to death. Kratz's sensational presentation was based ex exclusively on Brendan Dassey's confession. Kratz knew that there was no evidence to corroborate Dassey's confession and implicate Stephen Avery, even though the police for the previous four months had exhaustively searched Avery's trailer, garage, and other parts of his property. Kratz also knew that this was that this new account of the rape, torture, murder of Teresa Halbach contradicted virtually every fact Kratz had alleged in his original criminal complaint against Avery, and place the place where Teresa Halbach was killed. The garage, the weapon used, the gun, the cause of death, gunshots to the head. Kratz asserted that have now deter we have now determined what occurred sometime between 3.45 p.m. and 10 or 11 p.m. on the 31st of October. He then proceeded to recount for the media, the viewing audience, and ultimately a nation nationwide audience the following allegations. Avery, Avery, partially dressed and full of sweat, you know, we all know that one, invites Dassey, his 16-year-old nephew, into the trailer. Teresa Halbach, completely naked and shackled to the bed, screams louder and louder for help. Avery invites Dassey to sexually assault Halbach, telling him that he, is re he has repeatedly sexually assaulted her. Dassey proceeds to sexually assault Teresa Halbach, who begged him, who begged the 16-year-old for help. Avery watches as his 16-year-old nephew raped this woman. Avery compl compliments Brendan on what a good job he did. Avery tells Brendan of his intent to murder Teresa Halbach. Brendan watches as Stephen Avery takes a butcher knife from the kitchen and stabs Teresa Halbach in the stomach. A butcher knife, by the way, that they never found any trace of anything on. They And, and trust me, they pulled every single knife out of that place and not, they didn't find anything. Brendan cuts Teresa Halbach's throat, but she still doesn't die, and Avery and Dassey together sadistically inflict on Teresa Halbach additional torture, additional mutilation, additional mechanisms of death, which include manual strangulation and gunshot wounds. Kratz concluded the press conference by expressing low heart how heartbroken he was to tell Teresa Halbach's family the fate of Teresa. Kratz ended by stating that, as we sit here today, the individual that knew Teresa will remember. The individuals that knew Teresa will remember her, this extraordinary woman and the joy that she brought. Kratz's statements at this press conference constituted professional misconduct. Kratz, an experienced prosecutor, knew a prosecutor is not allowed to disparage the character and reputation of an accused, disclose the existence of a confession or the physical evidence, discuss any information that is likely to be inadmissible in evidence, and if disclosed would create a substantial risk of prejudicing an impartial trial and express an, an opinion on a defendant's guilt. Kratz knew that, this sta that the, his statements would make it virtually impossible for anyone watching his press conference to keep an open mind about the case and the guilt of the defendants. Kratz knew what he had accomplished. In a subsequent interview, he stated, I was hoping the media would not choose to release all of the disturbing details. Kratz knew that his statement would have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding and a substantial likelihood of heightening public condemnation of the accused. Okay, just wanted to jump in here real quick. How many people believe Ken Kratz when he says he had hoped that the media wouldn't show everything? How many people believe that? Right? <laughs> right? Am I right? Dude, he's warning children to to not... I mean, he's warning against children under 16 years old. He's He expects everybody to see that. I can't believe the kind of crap that this man claims. The... Uh, it's just unbelievable to me. So I just had to jump in and say that. I mean, I can't believe he even tried to say that. He hoped the media wouldn't go with all of it. Are you kidding, dude? You fully expected it. That's why you introduced it the way you did. You're such an idiot, Kratz. God. <laughs> Sorry, I don't usually say that, but God, that just, that one really galls me that he even said it. Oy. 
Moreover, although a prosecutor is barred from expressing any opinion on the merits of a case and the guilt of an accused, Kratz bolstered his grisly description of the crime by representing that everything he said was a truthful and accurate account. He asserted in his March 1st press conference that the law enforcement now has a definitive set of answers as to what happened at, to Teresa Halbach, and the law enforcement is presently executing a search warrant on the Avery property where we know exactly what to look for and where to look for it. Then, at his press conference the next day, Kratz assures, assured his listeners that we have now determined what occurred sometime between 3.45 p.m. and 10 or 11 p.m. on October 31st. Finally, Kratz's statements were likely to be accepted by the public as truths. More than any other government official, a prosecutor is viewed by the public with esteem and trust. The public looks to the prosecutor as the official most responsible for vindicating the rule of law and punishing wrongdoers. Given Kratz's prestige and prominence as the special prosecutor appointed by the governor to lead the investigation, Kratz's assertions that law enforcement had solved the case would almost certainly be greeted by the public with both relief that the public perpetrators had been apprehended and an outcry to punish them. Okay, so what Mr. Gershman here is building to here but you know he's building to but he's also talking about the press conference because of how much the you know Ken Kratz just completely muddied the water made it where it was impossible almost pretty much almost impossible to feel the jury there that would be open-minded and but the more important thing that he's setting up here is the fact that King Kratz did that press conference like that full well knowing he couldn't use it at trial for Stephen he couldn't use it for Stephen okay and the fact that he was doing that was creating the ability for him to educate his future jurors of of something he wanted them to be aware of but that he couldn't present in court and that is what this gentleman mr. Gershman is basically pointing out that he that he that is his opinion of what Kratz was trying to pull right here all right, so obviously interesting opinion, but what you got to remember with these opinions is obviously these these people aren't just like Joe some Joe Blow. They these are people that have spent their life working in their field. They are the tops in their field. Uh, I mean, you saw this guy's credentials, uh, Mr. Gershman. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, you know these people are very smart and they've been around. They've seen these types of things, and so they know what to look for. And that's what's important here about uh, Mr. Gershman. He is just giving us his, the way he sees it. When he looks at the situation and he sees what he sees here, that's his opinion he, of, of what was going on in terms of the prosecution. Um, and like I said, it's his expertise. Prosecutorial misconduct is something that people come to him often for his expertise on. So it's... If nothing else, it's an interesting opinion. But hey, look, we also know, you saw the clip of Robert Milan in the video here, that we know Robert Milan agrees. You know? Robert Milan feels the same exact way. So, you know, as Mr. Gershman. So, that's, you know, that's the end of part one, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. Part two is tomorrow. Hope you guys will tune in for that, which will be the second part of the prosecutorial misconduct um, affidavit. I uh, hope to see you then. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe. We'll see ya.